From Washington, D.C., the Department of the Army proudly presents the tuba and euphonium sections of the United States Army Field Band. As part of an ongoing series of educational videos, we present Tuba and Euphonium, the Individual and the Ensemble. This program will feature the talents of our euphonium and tuba section players. On euphonium, Master Sergeant Carlisle Weber and Sergeant First Class Donald Burleson. On tuba, Sergeant First Class Daniel Sherlock, Sergeant First Class Jay Norris, and Staff Sergeant Scott Cameron. All of our performers are soloists in their own right and have studied with the finest teachers at our nation's best schools. With this instructional video, we will show you a brief history of these instruments and give you information that we believe will make you a better musician and performer. Hello, my name is Sergeant First Class Daniel Sherlock, tuba section leader and soloist with the United States Army Field Band. Before we get started with the instructional portion, let us give you a brief history of the tuba. 1590 is the year given for the invention of the serpent, a predecessor of the tuba. It was a bulky instrument made of wood and covered with leather. It had a wide dynamic range, but its strident, uneven tone did not blend well with other instruments. Composers made little effort to employ its particular capabilities. After Mozart's death in 1791, complete instrumentation of orchestral scores came into being. Composers began to include a contrabass part in their music, even though a contrabass brass instrument had yet to be developed. By 1817, a larger version of the keyed bugle was being produced by a company called Hallery of Paris. It was called an ophiclide. The use of keys made this instrument far more easy to play in tune than the serpent with its cumbersome finger holes. By the mid-19th century, composers outside of France were still reluctant to use these instruments in the role of the contrabass. Two years prior to that, in 1815, two gentlemen named Blumel and Stolzel developed the Berliner Pumpen, or piston valve system, in Germany. Enter Wilhelm Wieprecht, a Prussian inventor. Wieprecht patented the first contrabass tuba in 1835. Vprex tubas were pitched in F and double C and used a five-valve system, much like modern instruments. In appearance, however, they still resembled an ophiclide. This design made for a difficult performance in the lower registers, which brings us to Adolf Sax, who invented the saxophone. In 1843, Adolf Sax took Germany's version of the keyed bugle, called a bombardon, and added Joseph Riedel's recently patented rotary valve system, and the sax horn was born. Sax, however, decided to use only three valves and pitched his instruments in E-flat and B-flat. Since then, the tuba has gone through many forms. The helicon appeared in Russia around 1845. It had other names like sonorophone and the jumbo elsewhere in Europe. This shoulder-borne design led to the development of the sousaphone. The sousaphone was designed by American Ted Pounder of the C.G. Kahn Corporation in 1898 was named after John Philip Sousa. The original version had a bell that pointed skyward at Sousa's request to allow the sound to be diffused over the entire band. It weighed 75 pounds. The impracticality of this design was particularly evident at outdoor concerts and ceremonies where the weather turned bad, giving this instrument the rather unflattering nickname of the rain catcher. In 1908, the bell was redesigned to face forward and lighter materials have been incorporated to make their use more practical and comfortable, which brings us to the tubas of today. These are the instruments that we use in the band today. This sousaphone is about half the weight of the original. It still incorporates the three valve system and is keyed in double B flat like the original. It is only used in situations where marching is required. The smaller tuba is an F tuba. We use it for small ensembles such as brass quintet, and as a solo instrument. This particular model uses a six-valve, two-handed system that is favored in Europe. And this is the tuba that we use in the concert band. It has five valves and is pitched in double C, just as the tuba patented in 1835 by Mr. Wieprecht, although the overall design more resembles the sax horn. The euphonium is generally regarded as the tenor of the tuba family. 
This instrument originated in Germany around 1830 and was called baritone horn. The horn had three valves and was of a tapered tubing much like we have today. By the middle of the 19th century, brass instrument manufacturers were producing the euphonium. At this time, there were large differences in the tubing bore size as well as the flare of the bell. Adolphe Sax, a Frenchman, produced a family of valved brass or sax horns from soprano to contrabass and patented these in 1845. He brought consistency and tonal character to this instrument family. These instruments were being used in town bands and military brass bands at the time of the American Civil War in the 1860s. The establishment of brass bands in England and the popularity of concert bands in the United States made for more advanced development of the euphonium in the late 19th century. The large, dark, warm tone of the euphonium makes a valuable soloist in the military or brass band. The brass bands of England make a contrast between the euphonium sound and the crisper voice of the baritone horn. Let's have our research and development expert explain a key difference between the euphonium and the baritone horn. Aha! That is a very interesting question. First, what are not differences between a baritone and a euphonium? One has three valves and the other has four valves? Not. One has a bell front and the other has a bell up? Not. One is gold lacquered and the other is silver plated? Not. The main difference is the bore size of the tubing at various points of the horn. The baritone bore size is in the area of 504 thousandths of an inch. Check the specs. The euphonium bore size can vary from 571 thousandths of an inch to uh, 580 thousandths of an inch, 591 thousandths to uh, 610 thousandths to 640 thousandths of an inch, depending on the make and model. Another difference is the bell size, measured across the bell at its widest point. A baritone horn bell size may range from 8 inches to uh, 9 and a half inches. A euphonium bell size range is uh, 11 to 11 and a half inches to even 12 inches. Check the specs again. A perfect comparison is the English bore baritone here and the euphonium here. And another thing, what is the difference between a compensating and non-compensating euphonium? Because of the nature of the overtone series upon which all brass instruments are based, certain notes, those which exist further down in the series, are invariably difficult to tune. The compensating euphonium, invented early in the 20th century by Boozy and Hawks, attempts to solve this problem by having two sets of slide tubes for each valve. The primary main slide and the compensating slide. In certain fingering combinations, the compensating slide is brought into play and its extra length compensates for these inherent deficiencies, thus making the notes in question better in tune. How about three valves versus four valves? Any euphonium compensating or non-compensating may have three or four valves. The four-valve euphonium, cost permitting, is always preferable. The fourth valve allows for both better intonation in the low, min, and mid range, and also extends the usable low range of the instrument. <laughs> Thank you.
You've always been told to sit up straight, but has anyone ever mentioned why it would be a good thing to do? In the next few minutes, I'll try to explain what good posture is and why it's important to you. The first thing to remember is that in order to play tuba and euphonium with a good sound, you must move large quantities of air. Now, in which position can the body move the most air in and out, standing or sitting? If you said standing, you're correct. The body was designed to move lots of air most efficiently in a standing position. The reason is because most strenuous aerobic exercise is performed while standing. What we're going to do right now is an exercise I call sit as you stand and it works like this. Stand in front of a chair a few inches so that when you bend your knees you'll be seated in it. Now grab your hair, we're assuming you have hair, at the back of your head. Ouch! This helps to straighten your spine Move your chest forward and your shoulders back. Continue to hold on to your hair as you gently bend your knees until you are seated. Maintain your grip for a moment as you absorb how this posture feels, then let go. You are now seated correctly. You should not be tense or rigid, just sitting upright, alert, and relaxed. Notice how the head is up and facing forward, the spine is straight, and the body is balanced and relaxed. When you sit this way, your upper body is free to expand and contract as you move large volumes of air through the instrument. If you use a mirror, you can watch yourself to make sure that as you sit down, the only changes take place below the waist. The upper body should not change at all. Keep these points in mind later when I play some examples for you. Now we'll add the instrument. Keep in mind that the tuba and euphonium are nothing more than extensions of your body. Don't try to bend or shift your position in any way. Instead, bring the instrument to you. If the tuba is large and the lead pipe is too high, you can rest it on your chair and use a telephone book or seat cushion to raise yourself until the mouthpiece is at the correct height. A floor stand can also be used to lower the tuba until it's in a comfortable position. If the tuba is smaller and the lead pipe is too low, it can be held in your lap or between your knees. You can also use a towel or a foam block to raise the instrument so you can reach the mouthpiece without stretching or slouching. Again, a floor stand can be used to raise the tuba to a comfortable level. In all cases, the instrument should come to you and you should not have to twist, stretch, or bend to accommodate the instrument. Although awkward, a large tuba can be managed with ease by a small player by using these techniques and a little common sense. Once you are seated and are ready to play, you must be aware of your hand placement. On large front action piston valve tubas, the hand should be positioned with each finger on a valve at all times. The fingers should be slightly curved and the right arm should float freely, not clamping onto the tuba. On top action instruments, the same rules apply. Just be sure that your right elbow doesn't drop down too far, since that would cramp your fingers. On rotary valve tubas, the fingers should rest on the end of the spatula so that you have the greatest mechanical advantage over the linkage. The thumb ring, if you have one, is used as a reference point and a stabilizer for your hand. It's not necessary to jam your thumb all the way through it in a death grip. 
Just keep your hand and arm relaxed and your fingers ready for action. The euphonium and baritone hand position over the valves should feature slightly curved fingers. Do not jam the right thumb into the thumb ring on a baritone. Use a mirror in practicing to make sure fingers are over and on the valve buttons. This is very important for discipline of the muscle movement and to reduce a stress injury risk. This is an example of incorrect posture. Notice how the spine is curved and how the body slumps. It's impossible for this player to move enough air to maintain a good sound. The instrument is constantly being shifted from one position to another. Most of the player's energy is being wasted fighting the tube instead of used for playing. Look at that death grip on the valves. This kind of posture not only prevents the player from looking and sounding good, but it can lead to long-term playing problems if it continues for a long period of time. Does this look like anybody you know? Now look at this player. The spine is straight, the head is facing forward, but the body is still relaxed. There is room for the body to expand and contract for maximum movement of air. The right hand is relaxed and every finger is on a valve ready for action. The instrument is under complete control by the player and he seems to have more energy. This is what it's supposed to look like. You can do this yourself and notice a vast improvement in your playing just by putting some effort into good playing posture. In holding the bell front baritone horn, the player should cradle the instrument with the left arm so as to carry all weight with that non-valve playing arm and hand. We want to ensure maximum comfort for the arm and hand operating the valves. Most important is to bring the horn to you, not you going to the horn. For better posture, sit straight with both feet flat on the floor and bring the instrument up to your embouchure. Hunching over leads to poor breathing habits. Only if the baritone is the same length as your torso can it be placed on the lap. Now with the euphonium, again, bring the horn to you. Most weight is supported with the left arm. No hunching over allowed. An option that may be considered is the euphonium pillow. This is any pillow that will support the horn on the lap and lift the horn to the proper position. The weight is reduced from the hands, allowing more finger flexibility. As you saw earlier, tubas are designed in many different shapes and sizes. If you do not own a tuba but play one that is owned by the school, you may not have an option for a smaller or larger instrument to fit your body size. So I'm going to demonstrate several common problems using tubas of various sizes and configurations. You don't have to be 6 foot 4 and weigh 300 pounds to be able to play the tuba well. Physical size does create some limitations, but if you're reasonably healthy, there's no reason why you shouldn't, especially if you still have some growing to do. Sometimes the sheer weight of a large tube is too much for a young player. In this case, I would recommend that he or she play euphonium or baritone for a year or so until the player is big enough to feel comfortable with a tuba. The only real requirements that I can think of are a burning desire to play tuba and a love of music. In this segment, I'll go over some common problems with players and tubas of various sizes and we'll deal with some solutions to these problems. Here we have a small player with a large horn. Even if she rests her tuba on the chair, the mouthpiece will be much too high for her with reach without stretching or leaning. This instrument is heavy and wide, which makes it impossible for her to hold it in her lap. To fix this problem, she could use a floor stand designed just for this purpose. These are reasonably priced and are available at most music stores. The use of a stand allows her to sit on the edge of her chair, balance the weight of the tuba, and easily pivot it into proper playing position. Notice she's not contorting her body in any way to reach the instrument. Another approach to this problem would be for this player to rest the tuba on the chair and sit higher to reach the mouthpiece. Sitting on a phone book or a thick seat cushion would work very well. 
She can adjust the thickness of the book or cushion so that when the tube is placed on the chair, the mouthpiece is easily reached. As you can see here, it may be necessary for her to sit at a 45 degree angle in the chair to make the most use of seat space. Again, notice how the tuba is balanced comfortably and under control and that the mouthpiece is at the correct level. The tuba should never be played in the horizontal position across the player's lap. The bell should always point upwards when playing, otherwise you'll never be heard. This is a common cause of bad posture and poor breast support. Remember that air is the energy source for your sound, and in order to make the most of your air, you've got to sit up straight. The problems of a large player with a small horn are much more easily dealt with. Generally, this kind of posture problem stems from poor habits like leaning over the tuba, resting it on the chair, and allowing the body to slump. A smaller tuba can be held in the lap or on one knee. The knee method is acceptable as long as the tuba doesn't wobble or cause the player to lean excessively. Remember that it's important that the mouthpiece be even with your face so that you don't have to slouch or stretch to reach it. If you rest the tuba on the chair and the mouthpiece is just a little too low, you can also fabricate a booster for the tuba itself. The demonstrator is using a roll-up towel to raise the tuba slightly so that he can still keep the tuba on the chair. A rolled-up towel or foam block are better than a book because they hold the tuba in place where a book would allow it to slip and possibly fall out of control. That's a dangerous situation not just for the horn but for what it could do to you on its way down. With a smaller tuba, he doesn't need a towel. He's holding this one in his lap. He adjusts the mouthpiece height by changing its position on its leg. This allows him to sit on the edge of the chair so he can move as much air as possible. He's making sure that he's the boss, that the tuba is being moved to suit his posture like an extension of his body. The sousaphone is a tuba that has been wound around so the player can carry it on the shoulder. Although the weight is centered, these instruments are extremely awkward due to their large size. They don't play any differently than a regular double B-flat tuba. They're just larger, so their sound will carry farther outdoors. When carrying and playing the sousaphone, make sure that you're standing up straight and tall, just like in the first example I showed you. You may use a special sousaphone chair, but make sure that the instrument is moved high enough so you won't slouch when you play. Make sure that you have the correct number of bits or shanks installed. These not only bring the mouthpiece closer to your face, they also help you play in tune. When picking up a sousaphone for the first time, install two shanks for the mouthpiece, then check yourself out in a floor-length mirror or have someone look at you. The bell should face forward and be level with the ground, although some are designed to tilt upward slightly. The bell should not point skyward or down when you're holding it in the normal playing position. When you're sure the horn is put together correctly, check your pitch with a tuner. When tuning, adjust the tuning slide first. If you can't match the pitch, you may have to add or remove a shank, but only do this as a last resort. Now you see how good posture habits are important to playing your instrument well. And they are exactly that, habits. It takes time to develop good habits, so stick with it and be patient. Using a mirror while practicing is essential preferably a floor-length dressing mirror, so check yourself out regularly. Over time, you'll find that you can produce a better sound with less effort.
Hello, my name is Staff Sergeant Scott Cameron, and I'm here to get you to use more air when you play your tuba, euphonium, or other wind instrument. So get ready to do some deep breathing. The number one problem that I find in younger players is that they don't use their air efficiently. It is especially evident in young tuba players because as tubists, we are required to use large amounts of air to sustain a good sound. I'm sure I could bore you with the physiology of your body and tell you how and why it is, but I'm not going to do that. Instead, I will give you a brief lesson on two types of breath. The slow, deep breath to begin a phrase and a quick, deep breath that we can all use to continue a fast passage. First, though, let's establish what I mean by a good breath. A good breath is one that fills your lungs about 90 to 95 percent. How do you know what 90 to 95 percent is? Let's all see if we can figure out what our lung capacity is and gauge different levels. First, empty out all the air in our lungs. That's right, blow all the air out. Now take a 50 percent breath. Fill your lungs up halfway. Blow that out to 25 percent. Now fill up to about 75 percent. Now blow a third of that out to 50 percent. Now fill all the way. Stop. That's a full breath. What I'm trying to do is to sensitize you to your fuel tank. Your lungs hold air much like a gas tank holds fuel. When you have a third to a quarter tank left, you have to go out and get more. The good thing about air is that it's free, so you can fill as often and as much as you can. We also want to know how to take that air into our lungs efficiently. Place your index finger over your lips like this. Now breathe in. The air must enter your lungs unobstructed. This helps you to do just that. Let's try an exercise to combine what we have just learned. It is important to practice this away from your horn, which might tend to distract you. Altogether, we will breathe in on one and breathe out all of our air evenly for five more counts. We will repeat this three times. Let me demonstrate. In, two, three, four, five, six. In, two, three, four, five, six. Now let's try together, keeping in mind what we have just learned. Ready? Enough of the exercises. Let's get to some playing. Now, to start a soft, slow, sustained passage, such as the opening of Gustav Holst's first suite, I will fill my lungs slowly and fully. Watch as I demonstrate. So, I took a great big breath to fuel this passage, but how do I use my breath? My air is blowing out of my body at a constant rate. If I were to play this on just my mouthpiece, I would feel a constant stream of air on the back of my hand, just like this. <sighs> This constant stream of air is needed to produce a good sound. I can then take a nice big breath to fuel the second part of the phrase. Listen to it on my mouthpiece and then on the tuba. <sighs> Thank mm -hmm. you. 
What about when you have to keep filling up and you don't have time to breathe? We must always make the time for breath in a musical manner. That is, if you're playing along and the sound is suffering because you are not able to get a good breath, you must find a way to overcome. You can drop notes or take many smaller breaths to stay full. Let me show you what I mean by performing a beret by Johann Sebastian Bach. Because it is written for the violin, there are not many obvious places to breathe. How was I able to do that? I started with a slow, big, deep breath and tanked up every time I could. This enabled me to play long, extended phrases. The trick is to practice taking big, deep breaths all the time to keep your fuel tank full. Mark your music with breath marks and make sure you take those breaths. Practice buzzing on just your mouthpiece to get the air moving and the breaths in the right place. Exaggerating the breaths so you are aware where they are. An audible breath that is a breath that is heard is good. I often come across students who don't mark parts or practice their breathing. We weren't born with a tuba in our laps. You must practice taking breaths. Now listen as I perform a different section on just my mouthpiece. Listen to the quality of the buzz and the intensity of the airstream. I will check my airstream with the back of my hand. Remember, a constant airstream is vital for a good sound. Now on the tuba, it should be a piece of cake. I hope this mini lesson will get you thinking about the importance of taking big breaths and using a consistent airflow to achieve a great sound. It is not easy. You must practice and work to make it happen. Good luck. The embouchure is the beginning of your sound. The mouthpiece and the instrument are simply amplifiers for this noise. The first thing to remember about embouchures is that there is no absolutely right or wrong way to form an embouchure. It is preferable for the mouthpiece to be set horizontally in the middle and halfway between the corners of the mouth. The reason that it is impossible to say exactly where the mouthpiece should be placed is that rarely is a person's face perfectly symmetrical. Most textbooks will tell you to have two-thirds upper and one-third lower lip inside of the mouthpiece. That's a good place to begin, but let the mouthpiece settle into a position that is most comfortable for you, as I'm about to show you. My mouthpiece has a removable rim that can be used for this purpose. Something called a mouthpiece visualizer may be purchased at any good music store, and when used in front of a mirror, is an excellent tool towards realizing your optimum embouchure. Allow me to demonstrate. Differences in pitch are achieved by tightening or loosening the corners of the mouth, like so. I would like to give some helpful hints on improving the tone production and projection. We all want better tone in the low register, the high register, and the cash register. I mean that good tone must be established in the middle register where we do most of our playing 
before going to the extremes. The simple formula refers to the jaw position in the different registers. The lower jaw moves in the direction of the notes. The back of the jaw functions just like the hinge on a door. Remembering our embouchure set, the jaw helps in interval skips. From our cash or middle established register, we slur down to the low register with this syllable, T A. Conversely, the lower jaw moves in an upward direction from low or middle to the high register, Ta E, with that syllable. Now I'm going to try buzzing a mouthpiece alone first in these two exercises. And exercise number two. Now I'll use the horn in these two exercises. Now we'll do the second exercise. I'm playing a good basic warm-up on long tones and lip slurs for better tone development and endurance. Now let's try to get that sound to project out away from your chair to the last row of the auditorium. I do not mean just blasting away louder than everyone else. A tone can be projected at either a soft level, piano, or at the loud level, forte. I like a singing style or vocal style of projecting the tone. Three factors are involved. Number one, a gentle squeezing of the stomach muscles is needed. Number two, the mask, the sinus nasal cavities around the front of the face should be thought of as open as possible. And number three, a raised palate the back of the throat is very open, as when the doctor says, say, ah, when checking the patient's sore throat. I would like to play the solo from Holst's second suite for military band, the first movement, March. Perhaps you know this. First, I will play with an okay sound, but not a projected sound. <laughs>
Now, I would like to play the excerpt using a projected sound. And finally, I'll legato tongue the notes for a clearer version that is advocated by Frederick Fennell. This improves the response of each note in the phrase. Notice the sound traveled further, but was not that much louder. I am trying to create a sound with more resonance. The equation is gently squeezing with the open mask and the open throat equals resonance and projection. Telltale signs that you are projecting the sound are, number one, Tone is picked up by sympathetic vibrations and cause other items to vibrate, like piano strings, snare drum snares, or loose light fixtures. And finally, number two, your nose will start to itch if you have the maximum amount of resonance going for you. Hello, I'm Sergeant First Class Don Burleson and I'd like to share with you a few of my ideas about articulation and also give you a brief introduction to and a demonstration of double and triple tonguing. For a typical moderate attack, you need to pull the tip of the tongue downward from a point near the gum line of your upper teeth. There's no single place for the tip of the tongue that's perfect for everyone. Depending on the shape of your mouth, your tongue might touch the back of your teeth or a little further back on the roof of your mouth. This way, you only need to move the front part of your tongue a fairly small distance to get the notes started. The one place that you don't want to put the tip of your tongue before the attack is between your front teeth. If you tongue that way, it forces you to move the whole tongue a long distance back and forth, making tonguing slow and clumsy. Tonguing between your teeth can also make the attack too loud and harsh, and low brass players who tongue too hard in an ensemble tend to lose a lot of friends. Of course, a lot of players say, I have to tongue harder to get that note to speak. Notes that don't speak are really an embouchure problem, and you shouldn't try to solve this by tonguing harder. What will help is using your lips to predetermine the pitch of the note you're going to play before you actually play it. The more precisely you think about the exact pitch, the more precisely your lips will prepare to play the exact pitch, and the better the note will speak without having to tongue too hard or play too loud. For a legato attack, the main thing to remember is to move the tip of the tongue more slowly and gradually away from the roof of the mouth. Double and triple tonguing alternate using the back of the tongue with the front of the tongue for greater speed and clarity. Let's start with triple tonguing, used appropriately enough for tonguing triplets, where the syllables that illustrate this tongue movement are ta-ta-ka, 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 ta-ta-ka. When you practice triple tonguing, two things to focus on are making a clean attack and keeping the rhythm of the triplets even, regular, and accurate. Although most of your practice should be at a moderate tempo, occasionally push your speed until things break down. After developing some skill with triple tonguing, you can work on double tonguing. The syllables are ta-ka, and again, as you practice, concentrate on clean attack even rhythm and pushing back the speed limit. 
With double and triple tonguing, you must practice with a metronome. And what do you practice? There's plenty of good material in the Arbonne Method book. Now I'd like to play three short exercises from the Arbonne book to demonstrate triple and double tonguing. First, triple tonguing study number 23. Next, double tonguing study number eighty-eight. In this study, number 131, shows how slurs and double tonguing combine. One of the most important aspects of playing tuba or any musical instrument is forming a well thought out practice routine. I use the word routine because a practice session should be a structured activity conducive to learning and strengthening your musical skills. This is especially important for less experienced players who should form good practice habits early and to build strength and endurance. The practice routine that I'll use as an example centers on five basic areas, warming up, etudes or exercises, sight reading, solos, and warming down. We'll assume that this session will last one hour, so we'll give each area a time limit. If you have more time, you may use it to extend any area in which you need work. However, studies have shown that people lose their mental focus if they're forced to concentrate for extended periods. Plan to take one 10-minute break every hour. This way, you'll get more out of your practice. Before we get to the routine, here are some tips I'd like to share with you. Get in the habit of always trying to produce the most beautiful and characteristic sound you can imagine. If you don't know what a good sound is, listen to recordings of tuba and euphonium soloists or listen to a live professional player. Try to imitate the best sound you have ever heard played on your instrument. Try to clear your mind of anything that is not related to what you will be doing in your practice. Leave your problems outside the door of your practice room. You can always pick them up again when you leave after your session. This is also good advice for performances. Spend the money and get a good quality electronic, not clockwork, metronome and a similar quality electronic tuner. The metronome should be audible during loud passages and should have a calibrated dial or digital readout panel. The tuner should have an analog or digital meter to show your pitch and sense and the ability to sound each pitch of the chromatic scale. Better models can even tell you what pitch you're playing, eliminating the need to fumble with a dial for each pitch. Both the tuner and the metronome should be small enough to carry with you in your case or a small bag. We'll talk about using these tools in the next section. If your mind becomes unfocused and you can't concentrate, stop the session. You won't retain anything useful and you'll just be wasting your time. Take a break and come back later. This is not an excuse to skip out on practicing though. Band practice is not individual practice time. Even if you have an ensemble rehearsal, you must still go through your routine if you want to improve. 
One hour a day will keep you in shape. Add more time to your practice routine to see real improvement. The practice room needs to be as large as possible. If you always practice in a small room, you will perceive a very small sound to be really big and awesome. Find the biggest room you can. In good weather, take your horn outside and practice. You'll be surprised how regular outdoor practice will improve your endurance and your sound. Don't practice mistakes. Be absolutely certain that you are playing the correct rhythms and pitches, especially when reading a piece for the first time. It helps to go over unfamiliar music without the instrument by checking key and time signatures, fingering tough passages, and singing intervals. Singing is the best way to build a good sense of pitch that is essential to playing a low brass instrument like tuba and euphonium. This is because your ear has to be trained to hear the lower sounds produced by these instruments. If you can train your ear to hear the music on the page, it will make playing a lot easier. Don't be ashamed of singing. You don't have to sound like Pavarotti or Madonna. Singing is a valuable tool in practice and it's probably the most important thing you can do to improve your playing. Now let's look at each area in the practice routine and discuss the process. We'll go step by step starting with the warm up. The warm up itself can be a routine similar to an athlete in training. Your warm-up should prepare you for the physical and mental challenges of playing your instrument. These would include long tones, lip slurs, tonguing exercises, scales, range studies, and flexibility studies. For advanced players, exercises can be combined to streamline the session. Since the warm-up is different for everyone, your private teacher can help you design one according to your particular needs as a player. Etudes are exercises that help to isolate various technical and musical aspects of playing. Some of these may include slurred or legato playing, pitch, rhythm and technical studies, unfamiliar keys, musical styles and the like. Etudes strengthen your playing and prepare you for the challenges of playing band, orchestra and solo literature as well as other types of music. These may make up the bulk of your private lesson material. When practicing etudes and solos, always be sure you are playing the correct rhythms and pitches. If you learn a piece wrong, you can't unlearn what you've already done. You will have to relearn the sections you prepared incorrectly the first time because the mind's tendency is to go back to what it already knows. To save yourself a lot of time and trouble, practice carefully and with a purpose in mind. Sight reading is a skill essential to playing your instrument. A well-balanced, competitive player must have strong sight-reading skills. This is simply taking an unfamiliar piece of music and playing through it as accurately as possible, but playing in the correct style using dynamics and making as much music as possible. Here are some tips to strengthen your sight-reading skills. Pick an etude, solo or excerpt, that is within your skill level. With the music in front of you, look at the key signature. Determine its key and tonality, major or minor, by looking at cadences. Your teacher can help you if you do not understand these terms. Play the scale to fix the key in your mind. Scan the music for any key changes that might occur and continue as before. Look at the time signature. Determine what note value gets the beat and how many beats are in each measure. Scan the music for any time signature changes and do the same for them. Scan the music and sing through a good portion of it to get familiar with it. You can use your instrument or a piano to get your starting pitch. It's possible to learn sight singing to the point of hearing the music in your head as you read it. Pay particular attention to dynamics and style markings. Look for trouble spots like weird intervals, fast passages, tricky rhythms. You can clap your hands through difficult rhythms with a metronome. When you're ready to pick up your horn and play the piece, don't play it any faster than you can easily play the most difficult passage. This will be a fairly slow tempo, what I like to call the reading tempo. When you feel you're ready, pick up your horn and play through the piece at your reading tempo. Use the sidewalk method of reading. 
If you're walking along the sidewalk, you don't stare at the point directly under your feet because you'll bump into something. You don't want to look too far ahead because you can't see the street directly in front of you and you'll trip. You need to scan the street ahead to look for obstacles, but keep an eye on where you are so you can watch the terrain. That way you can walk without falling on your face. This analogy summarizes sight reading. The best sight readers are the ones who scan ahead but move their eyes back to where they are in the music. They do this constantly so they won't be surprised by an unexpected lick, yet they won't trip up on what they're playing at the time. The warm down is a relaxation exercise that loosens excess tension in the face particularly. It includes legato etudes played in the lower ranges of the instrument. This is an excellent time to practice playing in the extreme lower range. The volume should be soft, and the style is very smooth and legato. Concentrate on moving very large quantities of air as smoothly as possible as you play in this range of your instrument. Now I'd like to share some more advanced practice techniques with you. If you really want to learn more and become the best player you can, I highly recommend studying with a private teacher. The material covered here may be helpful to you, but it cannot ever take the place of private, individual instruction. Your practice routine will have to be tailored to fit your needs accordingly. As a rule, you shouldn't practice for one marathon session because you'll get tired mentally as well as physically, and your section will not be productive. If you plan to practice for, say, four hours a day, not an unreasonable amount of time, break it up into 30, 40, or 50 minute segments with time for breaks. Each time you return to your session, review the material you just went over for a few minutes, and then continue from where you left off. Try to challenge yourself every day with music that you don't play well. If you always practice music that you already know and that sounds good, you won't improve much. Don't just play the couple of scales you already know. Branch out and learn them all, major, minor, sharps, and flats. Once you learn them, they will become valuable tools that will make playing much easier. Spending the time to learn a piece well may be boring, but if approached the right way, it's really not so bad. The main thing is to take your time, go slowly, and be very aware of what's on the page and what's coming out of your bell. If you make a mistake, stop. Go back and sing buzz, and then play slowly through the passage until you feel comfortable with it. Practice in chunks of one or two phrases at a time, rather than trying to impress yourself by just blowing through the whole thing, mistakes and all. Once you have put several chunks together, then you can work towards performance tempos, phrasing, and musical execution.
Let's go through a typical practice session together. I'm preparing this solo to play for you at the end of this segment of the video. I'm having trouble hearing the pitches and playing the notes accurately in a section of the piece, so I'm going to take a chunk apart and work on it until it feels more secure. Then I'm going to play it in context to smooth it out and make it fit into what I've already worked out. I'm going to start at the piano marking. Now at the breath mark, you'll notice I have a, a G and a C sharp and a B flat. The interval from the G to the C sharp is an odd interval you don't hear very often and it's hard to hear in your head. So I'm going to play through it slowly, sing it, then buzz it, and then play and work for speed. Now that I've played through that lick and feel a little more comfortable with it, I'm going to go back to where I started before and try to put it all together into context and try to develop more of a sense of continuity. At this point, I feel comfortable enough to work for speed. I'm going to slowly increase the speed of the metronome and try to play faster, slowly at first, and then gain speed to, until I get to my performance tempo. Now you'll notice the piece is in cut time, or 2-2 time. 
the half note gets the beat. So I've been practicing it, quarter note gets the beat, to slow down the eighth notes. I'm going to now move the metronome to a slower tempo and play it in cut time rather than 4-4 four, four time. That wasn't very good. I'm going to try to slow it down a little bit in cut time. At this point, I feel comfortable enough with that section. I'm going to try to do the whole thing in context at performance tempo. This procedure can be used to hone your playing and listening skills. The more you sing and buzz on your mouthpiece, the more accurate your playing and listening skills will become. The tuner is a valuable tool in helping you hear pitches and to play in tune with yourself and others. Always keep fresh batteries in it and check it periodically to make sure it's calibrated correctly. When you are by yourself, you can check individual notes on the horn. With the tuner on the stand in front of you, play a long tone. As you play, look down to see where your pitch is. It may be necessary to bend the pitch up or down to make the tuner read zero. If the pitch is off by more than a few cents, you may have to adjust a slide. Try to make the tuner read zero from the initial tack to the final release of each note. You can make a chart for the pitch tendencies of your instrument and keep a log of your progress. Over time, as you work on your individual pitch, you will find that it gets easier to nail the correct pitch each time. In an ensemble, you should constantly listen to those around you. Playing together doesn't just mean play notes together at the same time, but match style, loudness, and among other things, pitch. Listen to how your pitch relates to others, and if there is a problem, adjust it to match. If you are in a situation where no one else is listening, make it your responsibility to play as in tune with the other musicians as possible. This is how you should approach playing in tune. If something sounds out of tune, assume you are at fault and adjust accordingly. If the problem is a constant, that is always sharp or flat, move your tuning slide until the pitch is corrected. Some tubas have the first valve slide positioned in reach of the player's left hand. If you own one of these, 
You can adjust any note that is fingered with the first valve, provided you can move the slide easily. Here are some other tips that will help you play more in tune. Sit down with another tuba or euphonium player and try to match pitches in a scale. If you hear an undulating or pulsing in the sound, whip up or down to adjust the pitch. For drastic changes, move a slide. If the sound suddenly seems to multiply and sound bigger with no pulses, then you are playing perfectly in tune. With another tuba or euphonium player, play the same note as above, but take turns moving away from the pitch and back. Get used to what in tune and out of tune sound like. Get with the tuner and check the pitches of all the notes on the horn. You'll be surprised to learn that many well-made tubas have problem notes. Learn where these are and adjust accordingly. Practice until you can play in tune with yourself. Don't just play the notes where the instrument wants to play them. Adjusting your pitch is as much a part of making music as the music itself. Listen. Above everything else, keep your ears open and listen to how you are fitting in with the rest of the ensemble. Never assume that your pitch is perfect and that everyone else had better tune to you. When someone takes that attitude, more likely than not, they are the pitch problem. Besides being able to play in tune, it is also important that you play with good time. The metronome is a great tool for learning to keep a steady pulse in music, as well as learning the difference between different tempos. Like the tuner, the metronome should always have fresh batteries. Try to avoid the clockwork types, since they have a tendency to wear out and give a lopsided tick. They are also clumsy to use and don't travel well. One way to use the metronome is to practice scales and quarter notes, one note to a click. Start slowly and work for speed. Then play eighth notes, two to a click. When you've got your act together, try playing sixteenths, four to a click. This is a great way to learn unfamiliar scales and strengthens your articulation skills, as well as your tongue and finger timing chain. The metronome can be used in the chunking exercise I showed earlier. Use it to keep a slow, steady pulse until the lick starts to work itself out, then slowly increase the speed. In sight reading, it helps to keep your speed down, especially if you have the tendency to rush. As you practice with the metronome, your ability will improve to the point where you will have an instinctive sense of a steady pulse at any tempo. When you are called upon to play bass lines or difficult rhythmic passages, a strong sense of timing will help make playing much easier and sound much better. Try these ideas on building good time. With the metronome at a medium tempo, practice a physical movement with the beat to strengthen your sense of time. Tapping your foot, clapping your hands, or tapping your fingers will do. See how long you can stay in time. A variation of this exercise is to stop the metronome momentarily while you continue the pulse physically. Start the metronome again and see how long you were able to keep the pulse going without speeding up or slowing down. Listen to recordings of professional musicians. Listen for how they play with the beat. Are they a little ahead or laid back with their time? Is the tempo steady? Listen to different styles of music to get a sense of where the beat is placed. While listening to the metronome, think subdivisions of the beat, like eighth notes or sixteenth notes. Subdivision will make your sense of pulse stronger. Always use the metronome when you practice. Get used to hearing that click in your head when you play. Get in the habit of playing with good, solid time. Performance jitters. Everybody gets them. Here are some ways to deal with this common problem. You've been waiting in that cold hallway with 40 other brass players, waiting to go into that room to play four yet unannounced scales, a solo, and two etudes. No one talks much. Tension is high. You've been to the restroom six times, and just as you think you might go again, your name is called. Panic! As the door closes behind you, you suddenly realize how cold your horn is. Sound familiar? What you're feeling is a natural process called the fight-or-flight response. It's the body's way of dealing with stress. Either fight the stressor to the death, or run away as fast as you can. Among other things, this response causes lots of adrenaline to flow through your system, which causes nervousness and the shakes. 
Experience is the best way to control this natural fear. The more performances and auditions you participate in, the more accustomed you will become to this type of stress. Avoid drinking lots of coffee or sodas that contain caffeine. Caffeine causes your heart to beat faster, your blood pressure to rise, and stimulates the production of adrenaline. This, of course, will just make the jitters worse. Stick to water or juice. Make sure you get a good breakfast or lunch at least two or three hours before the big moment. You're going to need the energy to concentrate. Something light with lots of carbohydrate is best, and be sure to drink plenty of water. Practice deep breathing. When you're feeling stressed out, take several slow, deep breaths. As you exhale each time, feel the tension leave your body. If you move lots of air as you play, you'll find that the initial nervousness will fade and you can concentrate on making music. Above all, try to have fun. After all, this is music, not brain surgery. If you have fun, that enjoyment will come through in your playing, making your performance that much more effective. We would now like to present a euphonium and tuba sectional on the opening eight measures from the first movement of Gustav Holst's first suite in E-flat for military band. This exposed ground bass line requires attention to intonation, phrasing, and precision. Three distinct ways of playing this opening will be demonstrated. The tempo for this example will be quarter note equals 88 beats per minute. In example number one, the phrase is carried through the break in the written music by using a staggered breathing technique. This is often the preferred method of performance. example number two, we phrase or all take a breath when written in the music. You must listen to one another to match the phrase endings exactly.
In our final example, all notes are played with a legato tongue technique. This technique helps to guarantee that all of the notes will speak and adds an element of control to the performance. A very smooth, connected style is recommended. In this example, the phrase is carried through as in example number one. The more we practice together on excerpts such as this, the more well-blended our sounds become. The goal is to sound not like five separate instruments, but one large section. It has been our pleasure working with you today, and we hope that you've learned something from our little presentation. Remember, every time that you pick up your instrument, you owe it to everyone within hearing to play as beautifully as possible. Listen to the recordings of great players such as Brian Bowman, Harvey Phillips, Stephen Mead, Roger Bobo, and Daniel Perantoni, just to name a few. Get together with other players as often as you can. We learn as much from our students as we do from our teachers. Have people listen to you when you play, and then have them tell you what they think of your playing. Don't be afraid of criticism. Whenever someone learns what we do for a living, they never say, I sure am glad that I gave up music when I was a kid. It's always, I wish I had never stopped playing the piano. I wish I'd never stopped playing the clarinet, the tuba, the euphonium. Don't ever quit. You don't have to make a living at it. Heck, you don't even have to be good at it. You just have to enjoy it. On behalf of all the men and women of the United States Army Field Band, thanks for watching and good luck. Thank you.